Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Sanchez Navarro, senior representative with te uh, in Texas for Defenders of Wildlife. And uh, with me today is Romy Swanson, Director of Conservation Strategy at Audubon, Texas, and Jenny Blair, Principal at Blair Wildlife Consultant. Today, we're gonna to be talking about maintaining healthy wildlife populations on private lands. Um, Texas, uh, as you've heard probably throughout this conference, and you'll hear again, 95% of, of Texas is private lands. It's a big state, big on biodiversity and habitats, has booming growth, and we're looking at, so with all of that, we're looking at where does wildlife fit in? Um, and what can we do to help species survive the changes? On this panel, we'll hear from two wildlife experts who have great experience in the field, worked with a variety of landowners to create wildlife management plans for specific areas. They'll talk to us about the wildlife, a few of the tools available to get things done, and share some of their experiences of what works and some of the challenges we face as we work to balance that land management need with wildlife needs. Um, first, we'll hear from Romy Swanson. As I mentioned, he's the Director of Conservation Strategy for Autumn in Texas, where he works with state, national, and international partners to identify and advance important conservation strategies to benefit landscapes, birds, and the communities that depend on them. He spent over a decade as private lands biologist and technical guidance consultant, working on a variety of land and wildlife conservation issues throughout Texas. He's a certified wildlife biologist and president of the Texas chapter of the Wildlife Society, Texas's largest professional society of wildlife managers and researchers. He's active with, within the Texas Land Trust community and formerly served as conservation program manager with Hill Country Conservation Conservancy. He received a master's degree in 2009 from Texas State University studying wildlife ecology. Roman lives in Austin and enjoys spending time with his family, hunting, camping, and photographing wildlife, which I personally can say are some fantastic photos that he thankfully shares on social media. Uh, we also have today with us Jenny. She's a principal and owner of Blair Wildlife Consulting, LLC, and she's a certified wildlife bi biologist. She has over 17 years of diverse experience as an environmental professional. Her main experience is in environmental planning and permitting of terrestrial and wildland wetland ecosystems with focus on the areas of planning and implementation services for wildlife, land, and natural resources management, and everything that all of that involves. She specializes in land and natural resources management planning and implementation, endangered species surveys, assessments in permitting habitat, excuse me, permitting habitat and, bi and biological assessments, GIS mapping and analysis and conservation baselines, baselines and monitoring, among so many other specialties. She's prepared and contributed to several large-scale multi-species habitat conservation plans and environmental impact statements, in addition to spearheading implementation efforts upon, upon permit issuance with landowners. And I'm, as I mentioned, I'm Paul Sanchez Navarro, the senior representative in Texas for the Southwest Program of Defenders of Wildlife, based in Austin. I've worked in conservation planning, environmental policy, and community engagement around the world, and conservation program operations directing a conservation organization on the Mexican Caribbean before coming back to my childhood state of Texas. Happy to be back and working to protect the incredible wildlife in the Lone Star State. So with that introduction, I think I'll turn things over to Romy for his, our first presentation on the panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and good morning to everyone out there in the interwebs. It's a new age we're living in, and uh, I'm very happy to be able to visit with you despite the pandemic and uh, commune. Uh, over one of my most favorite topics, or the combination of two of my most favorite topics, which are the biodiversity of Texas and those wonderful land stewards that work to manage for and preserve that biodiversity. I want to make quick reference to uh, and shamelessly plug my, my personal blog, The Modern Texas Naturalist or moderntexasnaturalist.com, where I uh, enjoy sharing many stories working with the landowners and the organizations on the landscapes that support this biodiversity. So please uh, do go check it out as you have time. You'll see lots more vignettes and photographs there. I love hitting on why Texas is so special and everybody probably has their own answer to this question, but I like to look at it through the lens of biodiversity or all of that wildlife that exists within the state. And Texas truly sits in a unique position continentally where we get to see 
incredible amounts of influence from both the Southeast, the Central Midwest Plains and the mountain and ranges basins of the, of the Southwest and Western Rocky Mountains. And you can see that here uh, graphically through this geophysical provinces of the continental US, you can see multiple colors converging right there on Texas. You can dial in a little bit further and you can see that in the 11 or 12 uh, eco regions, depending upon what map you're looking at, uh, that sort of delineate different distinct ecologies within the state. And those ecologies support various uh, vegetational classifications and covers. As you can see, I'll always like to say that this map looks like a kid got loose with a pack of crayons. But these are representative, these are lines on a map representative of the different vegetational communities that exist throughout the state, and it's incredibly diverse. Uh, we run the gamut of elevation. We have over 350 miles of coastline at zero feet in elevation, but also on the other side of the state have a peak at over 8,750 feet above elevation in the Guadalupe Mountains. Interestingly enough, the Davis Mountains support over 800 square miles of land mass above one mile in elevation, truly a mile high area within the state. And then we also see a, a broad and wide spectrum of uh, precipitation gradients. So we see much rainfall in the southeastern area of Texas above Beaumont and very little in the western part of the state where we see less than sometimes 14 inches around El Paso compared to over 60 inches near Beaumont. And all of this comes together to paint a story of biodiversity. So all of these different elements uh, support different species or uh, different habitat that these species rely upon. And in 2015, Jenkins et al., he published, they published a paper that illustrated the nine most important biodiversity hotspots within the U.S. to preserve if you wanted to preserve the continental US, uh, the maximum amount of continental US species diversity. We don't have to just see this through maps. We can experience this on the ground outside. I like to use this example uh, that I came across where I was observing this yellow-throated warbler. This is a decidedly southeastern uh, distributed species within the US. We see a little bit of, uh, of its range occurring here within the hill country confined primarily to the rivers where we see elements of southeastern bottomlands. But in this case, we're watching this bird. It's singing on territory. This is a male very proudly claiming his, his turf. And, um, and it's singing from a plant that is more associated, this is called Leatherstem, more associated from these arid, arid grasslands, arid shrublands of South Texas or West Texas. And in this case, we're in the Chihuahuan Desert. This bird is singing on territory, the Devil's River in Valverde County. So we see this two different elements coming together in a single place in time. So we're, we're seeing some of this biodiversity and the convergence of ecosystems right here in the state. I've played this game before while birding and I tell a lot of stories. Of course, many of you recognize me as, a, as an employee of Audubon, Texas, and I'm gonna tell a lot of stories through the, through the lens of birding and bird watching, but we see a, a similar story play out at a different occasion where I'm sitting without moving my feet, watching a barred owl singing from a, a wooded area along a creek, while at the same time, listening to a very bunting singing. Now, the barred owl that I showed you just before is a very much Eastern distributed species. This is the Eastern half of Texas on into Georgia and, and all over the Eastern United States, but the varied bunting is a Western distributed species, Western in the state, in the Arizona in the Southwest. But at the same time, I'm also listening to more or less seed eater, a decidedly Southern distributed species, primarily associated with central Mexico, but occurring in low numbers along the Rio Grande. All of this occurred at one moment in time for me, blew me away. I was on San Felipe Creek in Del Rio, Texas, Valverde County. So clearly, these aren't just points on a map or illustrations. This can occur while you're out on the landscape. To make this point and to really drive it home, um, this is some older data from the early 2000s, but I think it's still relevant. Texas biodiversity in relation to all of the other states, Texas is the second highest number of species uh, of all states. It supports the third highest level of endemism or animals that only occur within Texas 
only behind Hawaii where almost everything is endemic in California. And we're number one when it comes to birds and reptiles, number two with mammals to plants. Sort of visualizing this, you can see that uh, the Texas coast supports an incredible amount of bird diversity. The warm spot along the Texas coast shows that 200, nearly 250 different species are supported along the Texas coast in some part of their annual life cycle. And the same plays out whenever you look at reptile diversity. These maps are coming from Biodiversity Mapper. So we have a wonderful amount of biodiversity, but we also have immense conservation challenges, challenges to that biodiversity. And I think many of us are aware of the uh, high amount of, of land use change that is occurring through time in a state that's 95% privately owned we recognize and honor the, the right of the private landowner to manage land for their purposes, for their intent. But we also recognize the responsibility of stewardship and stewardship of wildlife and wild places. Texas has lost approximately 2.2 million acres of working lands or open space between 1997 and 2017. And staggeringly, 1.2 million of those acres were developed in just the five, last five years of that period. Anyone that's paying attention saw the three billion bird report, the three billion birds report uh, uh, provided last year in which we saw there's been an almost three billion bird, individual birds lost in comparison to 1970. So in the last 50 years, there are three billion individual birds not a part of our ecosystems that were there in the last 50 years. And overall in the United States, that represents a quarter of all individuals. But we know that not all guilds or assemblages or groups of birds are hit or declining the same. Some are hit a lot harder than others. Others are actually uptrending. And this next graphic sort of illustrates that. Grassland birds are those birds that are likely hit the hardest uh, of all birds that are obligate to grassland ecosystems, about 50%, there's been a 50% decline in populations. And we see the Eastern forest experiencing similar declines in migratory birds also. It's not all doom and gloom though. We know that some groups have truly benefited from some of the conservation successes over the last 50 years, namely waterfowl. Our sportsmen and sportswomen have really taken up the mantle and providing a sustainable funding mechanism to preserve and conserve wetlands that have benefited waterfowl while also engaging in a consumptive use of the wildlife resource. We know that Rachel Carson awoke society through her book, Silent Spring, making us aware of the, of the real challenges to our ecosystems, to wildlife, through the use of different pesticides and herbicides. And just some best management practices, some improvements in technology have allowed for raptors to really increase. And woodpeckers are doing well now as the woodlands and forests are doing well. And we're able to incorporate woodland management even into our urban and developed ecosystems. Staggeringly, Texas uh, supports an incredible amount of biodiversity, but an incredible amount of biodiversity at some level of risk. And in 2002, the Nature Serve report showed that over 10% of species in Texas were at some level of risk, whether threatened or endangered or highly imperiled. Bird species, approximately 3% of the birds that occur within the state were, were challenged to some degree. And now updated data from Texas Conservation Action Plan put together by Texas Parks and Wildlife and many stakeholders and partners shows 1,300 different species of greatest conservation need, of which 110 species of birds. Texas supports approximately 500 species of birds as a, as a natural part of, the, of their life cycle, either resident, overwintering, or migratory breeders. And 20%, over 20% of those species are at some level of risk. Many people ask, why does biodiversity matter? And to many of us, it's a simple question. It just inherently does. We may pose, why does it not? But to other audiences, we sometimes need to make real meaningful and sometimes economic um, considerations for why biodiversity matters. Looking through the bird lens, we know that there are 
wonderful ecosystem services provided by our birds. And in some cases, we benefit from pollination by birds. And I certainly believe that many plants out in the Chihuahuan desert ecosystem uh, benefit from pollinization from birds. And some of our farmers may even benefit from pollinization from heart hummingbirds. We know seed dispersal is an important part of the equation and birds are really good at it because they can not only just pick up seeds, they can move seeds great distances so that there's genetic interchange within forest ecosystems. And that's an important part of the equation. Insect control, who doesn't want purple martins and barn swallows flying around and eating up those pesky mosquitoes? Nutrient cycling, uh, I've observed as you know, local governments have employees out driving around picking up dead animals on the side of the road. But we also have vultures that do that, caracaras that do that without uh, a paycheck being received. Uh, prey, many of these animals serve as important prey for uh, animals on higher up on the food chain. Um, there's, a, there's a burgeoning, growing ecotourism industry. We're seeing that the, the, the Rio Grande Valley benefits from immense ecotourism driven by the colorful birds that reach the northern extents of their range right there uh, in South Texas. And if you read any of the early settlement era, if you read any of the early writings and poetry, you know that birds and bird song were inspirational to our early American poets. And then of course, folks like Jenny and Paul and I, we all look to bird and bird communities for the important barometer of ecological health that they can provide through our monitoring endeavors. I'll now very briefly, very, very briefly, uh, underline the goals of conservation. This is it broken down most simply. Number one, we, we seek to preserve those functional and intact ecosystems that remain. And the folks that work within this audience have done uh, immense work and have made great strides in preserving those last intact places we can see dotted throughout the uh, iconic landscapes of the Davis Mountains, the Devil's River, the Natchez Bottomlands. So we've done incredible work. There's still more to be done, uh, but a lot of work has been accomplished through the great effort of, of this great community. We seek also to restore ecolog ecological function, and that's where we need to lean hardest on those folks that own and control the management of the land, the remainder of the landscape. We seek to improve its function and to make the footprint of the intact, resilient landscape larger. And that's by coordinated effort with our private landowner partners. And then we always endeavor, we always seek to understand the ecological systems to improve our understanding and to apply best management practices and to adapt those practices as we learn more. So we acknowledge now that private land ownership and stewardship is incredibly important part of the conservation equation. But what exactly is land stewardship? And I'll be borrowing heavily in a lot of ways. These will be carbon copies if you ever see Steve Nelly talk because there's not much to improve on his definition of land stewardship. The misconception, first we clear the misconception, land stewardship is not just the practices to improve the quality of land. It is not prescribed grazing, it is not prescribed fire, it is not brush management or erosion control, but it is a relationship, a tender, ethical relationship, the land that you steward, recognizing that it is not yours necessarily, but it's your turn. There are many byproducts associated with land stewardship. Uh, we see the improved quality of soils, and that's the building block for the habitat that is required for our biodiversity. We see an improved functioning of the water cycle, uh, the liquid heart of all of our landscapes. We notice that uh, an important byproduct of land stewardship is an adverse an abundant wildlife, an array of interesting species, whether we know about them or not. It's not just those that are hunted or fished. Another byproduct of land stewardship is typically productive and profitable agriculture. And this is an important part of the equation because this allows the land steward to continue operating 
hopefully that profitability allows for more of uh, more investment back into the restoration and improved functionality of their ecosystems. If the products of agriculture feed our belly, the, the, the natural beauty and the scenic vistas feed our souls. So beautiful landscapes, iconic landscapes, managed and operated under tender care of land stewards are critical, are critical. I'll now wrap up with a couple of case studies uh, that I've been involved with. And, and one of the things I like to point out is I, I always walk into a relationship with a landowner, a landowner that's looking to me for guidance, technical guidance and practical experience in the share. I always walk into that with, a, with the idea that you, you, you plan, you do, you learn, but which a lot of people know that uh, sort of circular graph, you plan, you do, you learn. Uh, but I think there's an element that that's an input that has to come in before that is you got to learn before you plan, you do, you learn. And, and an important and incredibly important part of my process is to just sit down, keep my mouth shut and listen to the landowner. Because although I may know a lot about the tools of land management, and wildlife management, it's their experience on the land that I care most about. I want to hear how their relationship has been. What have they noticed through time? And then I want to start to develop their goals. I want to help them reach their goals and understand their goals. I've been working with Andy and Nona Sampson at Hershey Ranch for over six years, maybe longer at this point. And when they took over uh, ownership and management, I think it, I think we were aware of all of the wonderful tools out there, prescribed fire and reseeding and all these things. And we were really eager, like many landowners are, but it's about sort of pumping the brakes and the and sort of working towards a goal. And it took us a while to really figure out what that goal was. And that goal ultimately ended up being, let's restore the functionality of this landscape. We have a lot of land that we get to manage. Let's improve its functionality, the hydrology cycle, the soil function. We assessed that we had compacted soils through historical overgrazing and other farm, farm and ranch uses in, in the deep past. And that we wanted to improve specifically for the group of wildlife that would naturally occur. So we wanted this ranch management to sit within the landscape and contribute to the populations of animals and functions that it uh, could support. So we picked a couple of important species, known as a, a big bird person, much like myself. And we, uh, we knew that we could focus on improving the grasslands and shrubland elements of the ranch to improve the erosion and improve the, the, the nutrient cycle and uh, contribute to the aquifers. Um, and to do that, we'd wanna see improvement of the grasses, the shrub layers, and some of the shrubby recruitment and hardwood recruitment that, that dots throughout that ranch. We picked a couple of species. You see the field sparrow there singing his heart out at the top of the, of the image here. And you see known as favorite bird, the painted bunting in the bottom. Easy birds to observe, easy to visual, visually uh, recognize, and the field sparrow's got a very distinct song, so easy animals to monitor uh, during their breeding season. So we've been able to, over the last few years, incorporate regenerative grazing practices, long-term deferment of grazing. We've been able to shred and disc, reseed, and try to improve things. And we're starting to see, through those practices, through the monitoring of these wildlife, great improvements. We've almost doubled the population of, of, of painted buntings utilizing the ranch. We're starting to see seeps and flows uh, pr that work pr uh, prolongingly into the dry part of the season. And those are all major, major positives because we're not just managing for the ranch and through our own uh, self-interest, but we're also managing on behalf of all of the great societal benefits, whether it's Again, aquifer recharge or uh, storing water and uh, limiting the amount of erosion that uh, heads out into the Pertinalis. My last case study, I'll fly through this one. It's pretty simple. I've got a landowner I've worked with who was pretty heavy handed with her brush management out there. She had a, a, an image of what she wanted her ranch to look like and she wanted longer vistas and she wanted to remove some of the sickly looking trees 
or uh, and that she had also heard that Ash Juniper was just not great. So we were pretty heavy handed with some of the management out there. But through understanding that her land also supported many, many, many hundreds of acres of critical habitat for the endangered uh, golden cheeked warbler, she she wasn't nervous about that like many landowners get. There was there weren't any anything stopping her before managing the way she wanted to. And when she recognized that, she she felt that there was incredible value and was very proud to see that that bird was out there. It was a very healthy population of golden cheeked warblers and that it may even help her provide opportunities to preserve her legacy in the management and operation of that ranch as she starts to think of succession planning. There was also the many tools available to support endangered species management or preserve habitat for endangered species that could financially compensate the landowner. The other thing that she cared immensely about was the flowing springs and seeps of her ranch. And we discovered that she had two species of salamander out there, one highly associated with, or only associated with her healthy springs, healthy flowing water and abundant flowing water. So we manage uh, these two iconic, charis somewhat charismatic species to tell the story of her ranch management, the change in her paradigm, and then to work and interact with her neighbors so that the influence of her good stewardship and understanding is not just ending at her fence line, but extends throughout the region. With that, I close. I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, attention. And if you have any questions, here's a little bit of information you can reach me at. We'll be very happy to answer uh, those questions at the conclusion of Jenny's talk too. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. Uh, thank you. Uh, especially, Romy, thank you for reminding us why we love Texas so much. You know, showing us that rich diversity uh, everywhere and then giving us some really uh, case examples was fantastic. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Jenny to talk to us a little bit about her experience as well and then look at the elements of successful land management. So I'll turn it over to you, Jenny. Good morning. Thank you, Paul. And for the introduction and thank you Romy for an amazing um, presentation and overview of uh, the wonderful biodiversity of Texas. So we're also gonna talk again about maintaining um, healthy wildlife populations and how is that done on private lands and why is it important? Um, wildlife management isn't an all or nothing concept and then, um, you know, as it says here on the slide, it's a sliding scale, no pun intended, um, upon which you decide the balance um, point based on what your land use is, your needs, your goals, and your interests. And when properly managed, an active sustainable use approach is often better for wildlife and the land than just leaving it alone. Um, as Romy had mentioned in his presentation, over 2.2 million acres of open space uh, was converted to develop uses over a 20 year timeline. And over 50% of that occurred within the last uh, five years of that um, assessment. Texas is changing, the landscape is changing. Um, those changes have effects and impacts on our wildlife resources. Most landowners don't realize or understand the benefits that their lands provide to wildlife. Wildlife, just like us, need food, water, shelter, and space to survive. While each individual property may not contain or meet all of the need, wildlife species needs, combined together across an area, it does. And there's two ways in which um, private lands can uh, provide for supporting wildlife populations and contribute to their overall health and sustenance. Uh, one of those is uh, ways is actively managing them. And then there's also passive management. Uh, active management, most people um, who are familiar with Texas and property taxes uh, are familiar then with the wildlife management um, property tax valuation. And that's a thing in which Texas created when there are not very many other states, if any, that I'm aware of that have the same sort of land use um, 
uh, incentive that if you have open space land, you can and manage it for the benefit of native uh, populations actively, then you can get a property tax valuation just like as if you were doing an agricultural production use. Um, and then there's passive management. Passive management focuses on open space lands that have a different primary purpose. For example, whether it's agricultural, uh, it can be residential, commercial, industrial, or others unusable, undevelopable lands, floodplains, like green spaces within urban corridors. They, they all play a role uh, in maintaining wildlife populations because our wildlife populations aren't just the big you know, deer and um, other game species that most people are familiar with. It's all of our non-game species too, and that includes um, reptiles, amphibians, insects. You know, pollinators are very important. Um, so, how do private lands maintain healthy wildlife populations? So, when you're talking about active management, TPWD has it set up pretty well um, within their 1D1 open space agricultural valuation on how a landowner should. Uh, manage their private lands in order to not only maintain, but sustain and benefit um, uh, native wildlife populations. And so the first thing and the most important thing is to identify your goals. What do you want to do? What species do you want to manage for? Do you want to manage for a suite of species? Or you want to focus on a primary thing? Do you want to look at habitat characteristics? Do you want to um, focus on trying to generate a certain uh, characteristic within the la landscape. Once you've identified your goals and you build, you put together your plan and that plan is going to identify a whole bunch of different types of management activities uh, on how to accomplish those goals. Um, then you determine what ag activities you want to implement from that plan. What do you want to start with? Uh, you want to keep really good records as well as monitor and analyze those results. And as you continue to implement your plan, you want to incorporate the results and adapt your management practices accordingly in order to meet your needed goals. If one thing you try doesn't work, doesn't, it's not to quit. Land management and wildlife management is a cyclical process where it, you know, there's not a, I'm going to implement this one practice and then I'm going to have three times the amount of painted bunnies on the property. Um, we all wish it worked that way, but it doesn't. And it changes over time. It changes with the weather. It changes on where you are. It changes with the land use conditions, what the historical uses are and how you choose to use the land. So within management, uh, wildlife management categories. If there's um, kind of it's grouped into seven categories. Um, you've got habitat control or management, erosion control, predator control, supplemental water, supplemental food, supplemental shelter, and counts and censuses. And so this gives you a, a numerous different um, uh, opportunities to implement different practices that when done together, you can create a robust and um, detailed program to be able to really truly become a steward of your wildlife resources. Um, and so within habitat control, your plan is a really important part of that. And I can't stress that enough. Um, you can use tools as in grazing management. There's you know brush control, revegetation, reseeding, um, restoration practices, as well as habitat protection for species of concern. There are some, depending on what species you want to monitor, for example, golden cheek warbler, you, you don't want to clear woody vegetation, um, jun juniper oak woodland from that er those areas, because that's what the bird needs uh, in order to be successful for breeding here in Central Texas. I've got some examples of what uh, some of the different types of land management practices may look like. So this would not be a ideal situation if you were managing for a golden sheep warbler. This would be an example of how you kind of start with um, trying to restore an oak savanna. Reseeding um, while also providing supplemental food resources. Um, and then utilizing 
livestock and um, other resources for management tools as well. Cattle are a really great tool for managing habitat as long as it's done in the right uh, stocking rates. Erosion control is also really important. You know, Romy hit on the uh, components of, you know, you're not just managing for your place, you're managing for, you know, the area surrounding as well. So water resources are really important. Um, protecting water quality is really important. Water is something that we all rely on and it's something that is a limited resource. Um, so establishing vegetation and areas susceptible to erosion, putting, um, creating features to uh, limit erosion in areas where it already is an issue, um, repairing, improving ponds, tanks, terraces, gullies, um, and otherwise are all activities that can be done to help to restore and regenerate the land. Um, and when those types of practices are done, they all provide a benefit to wildlife. Here's some examples of just some different types of practices that you can do um, in helping prevent erosion. This one here was one where the land was historically for a very long time overgrazed um, and the uh, soils heavily, heavily compacted uh, around the margins of the pond. And so vegetation was reestablished and then brush was placed on top of that to help hold that in and allow opportunity for um, those plants to reestablish and um, take hold around the margins. When you're doing large scale brush clearing, you wanna make sure that you uh, don't disturb the soil too heavily or else you're gonna have significant issues with erosion as it, um, if it does rain and stuff and on uh, shallow soils. Here's an example of a wetland restoration site. Uh, this is right adjacent to a um, five lane uh, major roadway with apartment complexes and, and um, uh, single family resident residences in it. And it just gives give you a diverse example of what, uh, how important urban corridors uh, and areas and open spaces can be within um, rapidly urbanizing areas. And you have predator control. If you're managing for karst species, like here in central Texas, where we have several federally listed um, karst invertebrate species that occur within uh, the subterranean habitats, as well as um, in our aquifers and groundwater, red, red imported fire ant um, control is a pretty important uh, aspect when it comes to managing predators and things that can affect those wildlife populations. Feral pigs, cowbirds, starlings, house sparrows, um, other types of exotic, uh, invasive, or non-native um, species, as well as sometimes, depending on the species that you're managing for, uh, if you want to enhance um, your, say, your white-tailed deer population, you may need to consider looking at predator control plan. Uh, for your meso carnivores or your larger carnivores as well. Some examples of brown-headed cowbird trapping uh, efforts, as well as what um, examples for you know feral pig and uh, non-native wildlife species can look like. Supplemental water is also very, very important. Um, marsh wetland restoration enhancement, spring restoration enhancement, um, development of stock tanks, guzzlers, pilas, um, letting your wells or your water lines have intentional leaks to provide access, you know, air, smaller areas where wildlife can access it because not a deer can easily access either one of these um, examples here. Uh, birds, not so much. Small as your small mammals and your meso carnivores. These are these some examples of without having that um, little ladder in there. If an animal was to fall in, it can't get back out. Um, birds need edge. They like little running puddles and ponds versus trying to drink from a larger um, water resource. Supplemental food comes in a lot of ways, and a lot of the practices that you do for habitat management can also I'll provide supplemental food resources for wildlife too. Um, food plots, feeders, mineral supplements, um, 
manipulating livestock grazing um, and stocking rates can also provide supplemental food for wildlife. Um, overseeding as well as in most cases pre prescribed burning too. These are just a couple of examples of some different types of um, feeders here. So this is a J feeder, it's gravity fed. Uh, it's mainly focused for your, your ground um, bird seed eating songbirds and um, ground species. Same thing with this, this is a quail focused um, uh, feeder. Uh, food plots are another really good example. And uh, also edges, edges are really important. Maintaining those edges around other open areas uh, where they have cover, escape cover is very important. Um, prescribed fire, returning the resources back to the, the soil and um, providing for new growth. Supplemental shelter comes in lots of forms as well. You have a lot of natural landscapes that provide supplemental shelter in and of itself, dead and down wood snags. Um, when you create uh, habitat, when you're doing habitat management and brush removal, pile those brush piles on site. It provides great supplemental shelter for a lot of your um, avian species as well as your small mammals. Mowing and shredding or the deferment thereof, um, fence line revegetation and management. Again, that importance of escape cover. Um, screening shelter establishment and management, um, windrows, as well as nest boxes, such as for cavity nesting songbirds, uh, wood ducks, screech owls, and bats are all important aspects that where and practices that you can implement to help uh, enhance your existing habitats. And these are just a couple of different examples, because you never know what you might find in this box. And then monitoring. How do you know what you have on your property? Uh, well, there's a lot of large different types of sampling methods and stuff that can be implemented on the property um, to get a better understanding. And as like Romy said in the beginning, to start with a plan, you need to know what your goals are. And to manage forest species and understand what your target species are, your target purpose, helps define those goals. And a lot of your counts and censuses activities that you could implement are things that give you a better understanding of what do you have out there? What are you managing for? Um, what, what did you find out that you didn't know what occurred there are all um, important aspects and um, things that can, can be garnered from different types of counts and census activities, whether that's harvest, harvest data, camera traps, um, different types of counts, uh, point counts, uh, transects, nest box utilization data, uh, as well as just incidental observations, all provide important, important information in terms of what the, how your wildlife populations on the property are doing. And then there's passive management. So, Maintaining healthy wildlife populations on passively managed properties are basically those properties that have a, a different primary land use. But just because they have a different primary land use doesn't mean that they aren't still important to be able and being able to maintain um, healthy wildlife populations. And a lot of times they're still fairly integral or, or critical to um, maintaining those wildlife populations whether it's agricultural operations, and that can be anywhere from you know, your livestock, your crop production, your timber production, um, as you move across basically from west to east across Texas. Um, it's typically what you, you see, and that's all based on the different rain gradients as well that the state receives. Your um, urban corridors, uh, your undeveloped lands and green spaces are, are crucial to maintaining healthy wildlife pets populations in and around and within and surrounding areas of high growth and land use change. Um, and, and if not most importantly, backyard wildlife management. Um, everybody can help with maintaining and sustaining wildlife populations. You don't have to have a hundred acres or a thousand acres or a hundred thousand acres. Every little piece counts. Um, and then there's other types of land uses too that um, also can provide and um, support maintaining healthy wildlife populations. And for example, your agricultural oper uh, um, operations. So um, for example, your 
bird species that migrate. A lot of our um, avian uh, species, we've got three different major flyways across Texas in which birds make um, thousands of mile journeys. Uh, whooping crane is a really great example where it goes from the you know, coast of Texas all the way up to Northern Canada twice a year. Um, without those cropped lands intermixed within the riparian corridors that occur throughout Texas and along the way up through the um, US, uh, the movement crane would not be able to make that migration successfully because they have to have places to stop over and they have to have feed areas to feed and to rest. Um, croplands provide a very important area for um, whooping cranes as well as other um, birds, your sandhill cranes, ducks, and migratory species. They're a great supplemental food resource um, as well as a sheltering uh, area during migration. Urban corridors. Um, within those rapidly growing areas of Texas, there were wildlife populations there that have now been displaced um, to, to maintain and try to sustain the diversity. Uh, urban corridors are all that's left that connect to uh, protect and preserve the um, genetic uh, diversity within this, a species, as well as the diversity of species within an area. If without the presence and the ability to keep urban um, green space corridors and that connectivity in place, um, if wildlife don't have their uh, needs, their food, shelter, um, water, and uh, things, they will not um, be able to persist there. And if they cannot persist, then they will, they will be extirpated from the area. And that's how we get biodiversity loss within areas of heavy land use changes in a very quick uh, time period. Then backyard wildlife management. Um, some of y'all who are on text birds on Facebook and social media may have seen this the other day. Uh, it's really exciting. Um, felt like it was a really good example um, to put on here. Uh, this is from a individual who ha lives in an apartment complex. Um, they've got habitat for this federally endangered bird, the golden tree warbler, you know, within a couple miles of their place, but their where they live is not um, wild uh, habitat for the species. But it doesn't keep the birds from stalking there and other birds uh, during migration on a daily basis for. Uh, important resources, in this case, water. Um, they had uh, over 40 warblers in a day of, seven, of across seven different species. Um, and this is in a, you know, a small little place uh, with just a little bit of supplemental water uh, put out. If the, if the species cannot make uh, the trip, then they cannot reproduce. If we cannot reproduce, we cannot sustain populations. And then other land uses. Um, so there's other different types of programs and stuff out there outside of just um, uh, your wildlife management uh, that uh, industries, uh, commercial operations, as well as industrial operations can participate in. One of those uh, examples is uh, the uh, Wildlife Habitat Council certification where uh, projects take their lands um, and they implement management activities um, and uh, study designs to monitor and maintain uh, wildlife populations on these otherwise uh, uh, industrial um, used lands. They enhance, restore, and they work towards that. Um, other programs uh, that y'all may be familiar with, um, uh, Audubon has several for uh, golf courses and for residential and commercial developments as well in terms of uh, recognizing uh, land um, projects where there are different primary land uses, but they have incorporated best management practices and sustainable designs in order to help sustain and maintain healthy wildlife populations upon project development. And this is an example of wildlife populations we have around uh, active quarry uh, as part of their Wildlife Habitat Council certification. 
So all these great things can be done, but how do we overcome the limitations and being able to actually achieve the goals that we we've set? Um, you know, there's only a lot, so much time. There's only so much money. Um, some activities may require permits or other red tape to be able to um, uh, achieve or implement on one's uh, land. Uh, strategies in order to be able to do that is looking into opportunities for partnerships, partnerships, whether that be in conservation, partnerships in funding programs um, or other grant programs, or potentially just phasing out. Uh, if you don't have enough financial resources or the time to, say, do the 100 acres of management um, or treatment that may be needed, we look back at doing maybe just 10 acres uh, and then doing it across multiple years. And that gives you a better opportunity to manage um, uh, and monitor the results to see if that practice is going to be um, uh, achieve the goals that you set for yourself. And while there are numerous programs that can provide financial assistance, most private landowners um, at the end of the day typically foot the bill themselves when it comes to management and species uh, and land conservation. Uh, and it's mainly because that, that, you know, these programs are so competitive and uh, there's so much, um, so many resources left that need to be uh, protected or want to be conserved. Um, that uh, in order to, to do them all, uh, one is a lot of times better off doing it on your own than to try to go through the programs to see if you may be eligible um, to maintain or um, receive any assistance with that. Um, and I kind of want to leave y'all with this last quote from uh, Aldo Leopold here. Acts of creation are ordinarily reserved for gods and poets, but humbler folk may circumvent this restriction if they know how. To plant a pine, for example, one need be neither god nor poet. One need only own a shovel. By virtue of this curious loophole in the rules, any clodhopper may say, let there be a tree and there will be one. By Aldo Leopold. And if you have any questions, um, please do let us know. Thank you, Jenny. Can we go ahead and go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, thank you again, Jenny. Um, I love that last quote because you presented us with a broad array of shovels, basically, that if each one of us can use one of those tools, we could actually become part of how we can maintain the rich biodiversity. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I think we, we've gone a little bit long and I had a couple of questions, but I have one because of your wonderful, part of the reason I asked you to be on this panel, both Romy and, and Jenny, is because of your great experience in Texas and all of this. So I have one question that I kind of wanted to get a little bit of dialogue on and there may be some questions on it afterwards. Um, you do have the information up on the screen for all three of us if you do have any other questions, but I had something that I kind of wanted to ask you all because you had so much, like, like you've shown this great amount of experience, of, of experience you have and this rich diversity of Texas and then all these different tools we have. And I think that's part of the purpose of this conference. I mean, that's the main purpose of this conference is to kind of bring all that together and see how we can protect more of Texas with more uh, fantastic stewardship over the years. But with your particular experience, I had one question about, have there any been any surprises in the presence of species that you weren't really expecting after a couple of years of successful habitat management, in any of the examples that you can think of, you know, you may have gone out there for really specific species or types of habitat you wanted. And I just want to know, based on your experience, were there anything that really kind of surprised you after all of that? Yeah, we've, um, there's been a couple of uh, projects that we've worked on that uh, we've had some very uh, surprising results. Um, species that are questioned to have been extirpated from the state. Um, have got some pretty, um, uh, I would say, verifiable records uh, on. So that was really kind of exciting, and it, it completely changed for that. In, in this example, uh, the, the landowner's mindset on how he was going to manage his land, the practices and stuff that he was planning to implement, but once realized that the species occurred, that um, completely did a 180 and said, "Okay, I, I, this is this is." A, 
a gem and I want to do everything I can to protect it. Um, uh, Romy, I'd, I'll let you uh, kind of jump in there as well. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things I'd point out is, um, it, you know, we're never really surprised when we when when we got working with a landowner that, that's in, incorporating great management practices, being thoughtful and, and looking to how their their piece contributes to a landscape and a functional ecology that goes well beyond those uh, those boundary fences for for us, um, particularly at Hershey Ranch. You know, we keep accumulating new grassland species. We need we keep accumulating uh, species to our bird list, our mammals list, our reptiles list, and nothing's really surprising. But I like to point back to the fact that we're that we're seeing more species that rely on that particular, more individuals that rely on that particular suite of of habitats, grasslands, shrublands, rangelands. So when we're seeing common species remain common or they're upticking more dick sisals, more painted buntings, more field sparrows. That's what we're really excited about as much as the uh, increased biodiversity of the ranch list. It's those species that are otherwise sort of declining through time that are maintaining or upticking as a trend. Keeping common species common is one of the most important elements of our work. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for sharing your time and your experience with us today. Um, and I'll turn it over to the coordinators of the event. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining into this session. If you want to head back to the virtual homepage, we will have the featured closing session at 11 a.m.